Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. So, welcome to the IXDA and Futurist Accessible Design Systems event. Welcome to everyone here live with us and online joining us via the stream. Um, so, today we have a really awesome program. So, um, there's a few practicalities that I'll go over uh, just for the start. Uh, but then we will have three amazing speakers and as well as a Q&A panel at the end. Um, about the panel, so while we have the speakers on, everyone can submit questions. So at any point you feel like, okay, there's a question I would like to ask any of the speakers or about the topic in general. Um, we have set up a mentee. So if that's not familiar to you guys, it's an online online questionnaire tool. Uh, so what you can do is you can go to mentee.com and you can wear a code. And you can see the code uh, here for anyone participating here. And it should be visible on the live stream as well. So at any point uh, during the talks, you can ask questions by going to menti.com using a phone, uh, laptops, uh, any device you have on you, uh, and entering the code, which is 83749910. And at the end of the talks, we will go over the questions uh, on the panel. Um, so I think I will hand over to to Suvi. Um, we will hear actually a short greeting from uh, the IXDA Dambara chapter. Let's see, hope it works. Hello fellow designers. So nice of you that you've decided to join this IXDA event uh, hosted by our lovely Futurize people. Uh, also, super many thanks for Futurist for organizing this lovely event. Um, I'm on other duties on Tuesday evenings, but just wanted to let you know about IXDA. So IXDA is an association for interaction designers and it doesn't cost you anything to join. Uh, so all of these free events are something uh, hosted by uh, individuals who want to join in the community and give back. So uh, just check the website ixda.org uh, and check the upcoming uh, conferences and events and, and stuff like that. And, and if you want or your organization that you're uh, sort of like working for wants to host an event, please contact me uh, or the IXDA local community at Tampere, which is basically now me. So if you want to also join the fun of organizing these things, please uh, ping me uh, on LinkedIn or anywhere else you find my details. I hope that we can get them flashed up on the screen somehow. Uh, have a nice evening. Uh, tweet your asses off so, so that everybody else also knows that these things are now happening again after COVID. The next event that I know of will happen on first part of next year but there is still room for everybody else who wants to host something. See you. Hello, fellow mm -hmm. designers. So nice of you that you've... Oh, thank you. So that was Taina, uh, my friend, and the, uh, as you heard, the IXD a representative here at Tom Tampere. So my name is Sobe Helen, Principal Design Director here. Nice to see you all here live after so so long time and, and everybody online. So just a few words about Futurize. So you're now here at Tampere Futurize office. We are a company that does and, and designs and builds digital solutions and services. So that's why we're interested in the, in the topic. We are international, we have international clients and we have our offices in Europe mainly at Finland and in Germany, three offices, and also in, in England um, and Stockholm. We have designers, approximately 150 in the company in total, and we, we roughly divide like service designers and UX designers. 
uh, 50 and 85, but obviously we are individuals, so people do like many things. So good to see you here. Um, then back to Mira. Thank you. Actually, I don't even know if I did tell you guys my name. So <laughs> my name is Mira Reilama. Uh, I'm a lead service designer here at uh, Futures Tampere. So <laughs> nice to meet you all. Um, so on to today's topic. So uh, accessible design systems, um, really important topic, two important aspects. And I, I thought we'd start off by kind of doing short uh, intros into, so what do we mean about when we talk about accessibility? What do we mean when we say design system? So we're kind of on, on the same page uh, about them. So I actually uh, found this, it's Aluehallinto Virasto, which is an English regional state administrative agency, very official sounding. Um, so they have these ac accessibility guidelines and, and what they actually say about accessibility is that it's a customer oriented design that takes uh, different situations and needs into account uh, as well as possible. I thought that was kind of nice. Um, so the basic idea is that the digital services are designed so well uh, that they take into account the different situations that they are used in uh, and the different abilities that people have who use them. Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting, interesting that they said that uh, they estimate that about one million Finns actually benefit or need uh, these kind of accessibility designs or, or um, things taken into account. Um, and I thought it was really interesting as well that they say it, there are certain people who need them, but we all benefit from them. So one of the examples they gave is, is subtitles. So for some, they are requirement so that they can understand what's being spoken. But for many of us, they're very helpful to understand what's happening and what is being said. So I thought that was a good, good example. Then on to design systems. And we will cover these, that the speakers will cover these topics, obviously, uh, a lot more deeply. But um, design systems, we um, kind of uh, establish design systems as these um, collections of components uh, that are can be used to build services. So um, they are components. There are guidelines, there are clear standards that can be used to build services uh, from the ground up so that they are hopefully accessible, but also they, they are kind of the same throughout uh, different touch points or, or different services within the company. Cool. <laughs> so just a quick intro for that. Okay, so I think it's time for our first speaker. Uh, I would like to... <laughs> okay, um, I would like to ask on stage um, Serhi Maninen, who's um, an amazing speaker. She, she comes from the Finnish Federation of the Visually Impaired, where she works as a digital accessibility specialist. Um, and her background is actually both in programming and design, which I think is very, very cool. And um, she will talk about a case study from the UK. Uh, it's a county council. Council, uh, the county's name I cannot pronounce, so let's see <laughs> if we hear it from Terhi. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's welcome Terhi. Hello, everyone. Okay, so uh, quite what's to say, a vague saying, how to create a cultural digital accessibility, quite grand. But uh, I tried my best that you walk away from this session thinking, oh, this is what I want to do. 
So just quickly, my name is Derhi. Uh, you're welcome to contact me. My work email, which is Derhi at Derhi dot at NKL dot FI, or find me on Twitter. So um, contact me if you have any questions later on. So case Worcester County Council. This is where I used to work, and uh, I spent spent there quite many years. Hence, I know how to pronounce the county now. But yes, drivers for digital accessibility. Um, right, working for public sector, you would think you are just thinking legal reasons why you would do things um, in an accessible way. But no, um, for us, it was about making processes lean, making sure that anyone who wants to access online services can actually do that. I mean, we didn't want people to contact us saying, oh, crap, I really want to report a pothole, but I can't because your form is inaccessible. No. So we really wanted to make sure that what we do is actually working for people. So, yes, reputation was one of the things why we wanted to make sure things are working. I mean, councils never get any thanks, I think, but we didn't want to get any bad mouthing either. So, really, they were the reasons. Also, a diverse workforce. Uh, why would I want to make things harder for my colleagues? It really didn't make sense to me. Who, I mean, they're using assistive technologies. So, why would I make life harder for Helen, who's blind and has to use a screen reader? Really didn't make sense to me. So, when you know that there are a lot of people out there, you don't know their conditions. I mean, one day you possibly are the one arm, you know, in a castle once or some, something. So you can only use a keyboard. How you can go about things then? So how we included things? Well, we had one team in charge. Um, I was one of the people there who were put on charge of accessibility. And because we had the ownership, well, we had the responsibility, but because we were the ones um, looking after the public facing website, intranet, so on, you know, we wanted to make sure that we are not the ones failing people out there. I mean, you heard the reasons before reputation, making sure that my colleagues can do the same thing as someone else. So, what it meant continuous learning. I mean, you have to really know about the standards, but it's not enough knowing about standards. You still need to know, um, you know, best practices and you keep going. It's continuous work. Then you start training others, give guidance to others. Oh, how do you make this Word document more accessible? Sounds boring, but you have to do that. Everyone in a team, we had in-house team, so they had to know how they make things in accessible way because no use if they make that stupid form then in accessible way so we all had our role to play to make sure that whatever we put online works for people so oops getting everyone on board can't say this was easy can't say that the work was done when i left However, I, I think I can say as a win, we did develop this sculpt framework that everyone in the organization had to go through. So regardless of your position, you have to know something about digital accessibility. So sculpt framework is free to use. I'm welcome to send information about that later if you want. But sculpt is about structure, color and contrast, use of images, links, um, plain English tables. And that became a mandatory training for all staff, like cybersecurity, like CDPR, all other things you have to know about. So I know that when I left, uh, work continued and still continues. So I can't say that everything is perfect, but you know, accessibility is not the destination, it's a journey, you just keep going. Mm -hmm. So, how to integrate? Right, well, I say become the ambassador for the topic 
and you know start creating the culture in your organization or school or wherever you are talk to your line manager talk to your teachers talk to your peers colleagues talk about accessibility what does it mean if you don't quite know find out also you're welcome to contact me and you know we can come and demo how um people with visual impairment use devices like screen readers that's very eye-opening i think for people so engage with different groups we're welcome to demo you things that might get the leadership buying as well because they see oh crap our software is, it doesn't quite work for people who are blind hmm great not so that can kind of give the idea why it should be uh, done things differently maybe you have a team or work group that you can put together maybe you are in in so advanced that you can start writing a policy for it ideally but what you can do as well is uh, review your responsibilities what are they at the moment if you're a product owner what are your responsibilities can you add digital accessibility there so that it becomes a requirement so from start to finish it's there and you make sure that the product is accessible actually it's your responsibility then and to make sure so it's in definition done if you are a ux designer what does it mean for you well you certainly have things there that you need to look after so it's still in your definition done and you need to understand how different people use websites and apps actually all these things related to everyone so no matter of your position you have to know but maybe say to devs and testers um, ensure you know uh, the, the guidelines what do they mean really boring to read and really hard sometimes but you need to understand what they mean so that you can actually build on those things I mean <laughs> you still need to know everything what you do anyway so this is like a addition that you need to worry about if you take it in a negative way anyway it should be conditioned for going live in my opinion um a bit of repetition but it's important so have that accessibility as a requirement regardless of your role it should be there so that you make sure that whatever you do it fits the um, requirements a thorough testing process I don't know what guys what kind of you have at the moment but does it have manual testing that you test how you use only keyboard how does it work for iPhone voiceover um, how does it work for NVDA uh, screen reader do you have automated testing do you use real end users you have peer-to-peer -peer reviews so that could be in every stage that you do you get together and see oh okay just tick those boxes fair enough let's go to next sprint but at least you've done reviewing and that's important you can't leave the things to the people who do the testing at the end or for the devs they've done something or heaven forbid at the end and launch and then think oh Will, it be, will this be accessible or not too late? So what you need as well, arranged training. So ideally you would have onboard training for everyone. And you would also have ongoing training for everyone because it's not enough that you do a bit of a course and then you kind of walk away and forget the whole thing like we all do. So you, you kind of need to become the ambassador and thinking like, no, let's do something about this. Let's have some guidance for people. And like I said, the sculpt framework, uh, regardless of your position, you need to know about those things. So arrange something. Uh, raising awareness for all staff. Um, they've done this in the UK so that they have done like a, like a, a lab where you uh, but at different stations and you can simulate things like okay how about if I only use a keyboard how about if I can only use the iPhone voiceover how about if I simulate how people see different colors 
that can be a place where you can have everyone investigating and wondering like oh what is this so you get more people excited and like oh i didn't think that mm, maybe i don't use colors to uh, indicate things anymore like it's like press that red button when you can't see red so yes my homework for you uh, ideally you become the ambassador today what's your excuse i'd like to hear it um, but yeah start a revolution today review your responsibilities what are those talk to your peers and you know your line manager etc sell the idea i mean it could be a whole new topic about this but you know starts from some somewhere and you know get the accessibility there as a requirement make sure you have a proper testing process you know whatever you do you need to do some testing even if it's reviewing arrange training keep going talk to your people saying oh i saw this course let's go all and do it and then spread the awareness and you know don't be like hoarding your knowledge spread it around and you know get everyone excited so yes that's my homework for you thank you thank you Terry. um so if you have any questions oh, i'll be maybe this side if you have any questions, so either here or online uh, for Terahi, or if, if anything kind of piqued your interest about the topic you would like to discuss, uh, have discussed later on, now is your chance. So um, mobile phones, laptops, any digital device is fine. menti.com um, and then you input the code, which was 8374. 9910. So there you can add any questions and we'll ask them then at the end. Okay, so on to our next speaker. So our next amazing speaker uh, is a UI UX designer. She comes from Pop Bank um, and she will talk about the design system work there. Welcome, Heli. Yes. So, hello, everyone. Wow. So, my name is Heli, and I'm here for telling you the story about PopPunk's accessible design system development. So, oh. Oh, so, uh, I will start with the point, uh, why did we need our own design system and what was our starting point for that? Uh, then I will tell a little bit of uh, development steps and what kind of challenges did we face. And final, where are we now and how do we use the design system? So, why, why did we need our own design system? Our design system story starts about four years ago. We had noticed some issues in our product development process and in our digital services. One of the main issues was that the design of the digital services was inconsistent. We had a lot of problems with usability and accessibility. And all of our projects had their own components. So having to build every component from scratch to each project took a lot of time. And basically, that was the reason why we had incorrect design. And here are some pictures of our old digital services. And as you can see, all of these looks different. Uh, there is different kind of layouts, uh, the use of using colors. And I count that there is six different kind of primary buttons. And that's a lot. And Basically, that was our starting point for doing design system. So how did we start development? We started developing the design system same time as we started redesigning our web page and new brand image. So we had a lot of big things going on with our brand at the same time. And after we had the idea of the new brand, 
we started our weekly meetings about design system. And in meetings, there was one designer, me, and two or three developers at the time. So not that many people. And every week we decide some elements that need to be done. Uh, we went through the sketches in a technical side and also think about the accessibility terms. And every time there was something to fix in the design side, with the elements, it wasn't so easy with accessibility. <laughs> and it was our first time doing design system. And about our challenges. Uh, basically, our main challenge were time, as always in every project. I don't know why, but uh, I was going to say, yeah, the time. So our uh, our need for design system increased a lot. And we had many projects ongoing at the same time, and all of these were waiting for new elements. Example, the website project that I mentioned earlier. With that project, we got a lot of help from Futurize. And I want to thank you, our Futurize team, for helping us also with the design system. And the second talents were our limited resources. We have only one designer in a pop bank, and we don't have that many developers, or we didn't have at that time. Now we have more. And we have to prioritize a lot and make the decisions how do we make the design system and when and how it would affect to our different projects. And then, of course, the accessibility itself. It was kind of new thing to follow. And as a bank, we have to complete with the double A level. So it was a little bit complex sometimes. And yeah, those, those were the main challenges. And about the positive impact. Our design system name is Populous, and it has speed up our process development a lot. User interface design and the technical implementation, it's much more efficient now. And we have about 35 different elements in the design system. If I remember right, six different modules and three layouts. And we are managing this design system by ourselves and that gives us the freedom to edit or add new elements easily. And we can evolve the system during different projects and needs, so everything don't need to be ready at once, thank God. And yeah, that saves our time that we can evolve the system when we want, as we don't have that many people doing the design system. And at the moment, we have four different published services that are using design system. And more is coming all the time. And the design of these new services is consistent and they look like a pop punk. And the design is recognizable and accessible. So with these new services and design system, yeah. oops. Uh, our classification and conversions are increased. And yeah, I think that we have a lot of happy customers because of design system and developing the new services. It's much more easy and easier for designers and also for the developers. Oh, there is a different slide. <laughs> well, this shouldn't be here, but I can tell you that this is a picture of our new digital services. And as you can see, it's much more clear and simpler. And we don't have six different primary buttons, just one. And a couple mm -hmm. different kind of layouts. And I want to thank you for listening and hope you learned something new. Thank you. All right, thank you, Heli. So again, I'll, I'll just recap. So if you have any questions for Heli, uh, we'll take the questions in Menti. So menti.com 
and then entering the access code so you can input the questions there. Cool. So last speaker, but obviously not least, um, we have one of our own. So one, um, we have Villa. He's from Futurist. Um, and he'll be talking about his work uh, for S Group, building uh, their design system or working in their design system team. So welcome, Ville. Thank you, thank you. Oh, my name is Ville. Uh, I work at the Futurist Helsinki office. I'm here today at Tampere visiting, just visiting. Uh, I worked at Futurist about five years now. Here are some of my uh, past clients. Uh, no, no, like let's say that not all of them are from design systems point of view, but actually I work, work with a design system at City of Helsinki as well. So public sector stuff is also, also um, familiar for me. Uh, but going in the S group uh, or SDS, S design system team that I have uh, currently with me. So you can see on the slide that we have a one PO or design lead, uh, four developers at the moment and two designers. And it's, it's a mixed group. Some of them are from S group, some of them are outside of S group, like me. Um, and what we work with is these business areas. So as we work with the design system, S group in whole has a lot of business areas and a lot of brands in those business areas. And these are actually just a few of them. So you might be familiar with some of the bigger ones, but there are loads and loads of smaller brands, services and businesses in the group in total. Uh, since we have a limited time, I'm gonna deep dive into the why. And uh, one of the big reasons is European Accessibility Act, um, as mentioned before, and why it's important that S Group is because of the highlighted few lines here, the banking services, the e-commerce, like you saw on the previous slide, S Group works with the banking services, uh, but also in e-commerce since they they are primarily uh, commercial company. So those are like the main fields that they, they need to cover when it comes to the Accessibility Act. Um, and as I told you about the brands, so how do we approach the accessible brands or brands to be accessible? so to say so like heli said before that they have uh, one bank and uh, maybe few services so we have a uh, a lot of brands and here are some of some of them that we have been working on this year on on top here and we work my team we work as a middleman let's say between the products and the and the actual brands. So on the lower level, you can see that there are many products that those brands have. Some of them might have one, two, or several products. And inside those brands, we have different teams. And the team sizes vary a lot. And these numbers here are not the actual numbers. Some some Teams might have 20 persons in them. Some might have three or four people. So there is a lot. Uh, and about the numbers, 
here are some of the brands, but now like like let's say Sokos bottles is like the one of many, but they actually have four brands inside there. So it's get bigger, it's getting bigger and bigger. And I counted today that it's something like 12 uh, brands that we have been working on this year, and it's gonna be even bigger in the future. So lots of things to work on at the S group. Uh, and how we how we approach things is the usual, you know, the, the need is there. You need the let's say you need a reusable brand colors and you have a brand. You need to have the UI components uh, based on that brand color or uh, style or whatever. So like here really roughly put you have the the color the whatever it is that the brand has and we need to come up with a UI elements you to be used in uh, digital services so pretty straightforward there uh, but very often as it is when you start to work on these smaller bits and pieces notice that oops so it's really not gonna work this way so actually the brand color might not be accessible uh, according to the WCAG uh, level AA that we're aiming at. And so we need to do something different. Uh, so how, how's that going to happen? Um, so I'm going to give you some takeaways here. And one of them, the first one would be that really early on, if, if you have situations like me and that was pretty basic one uh start to collaborate with the brands or your brand so i have multiple at my clients so you might have one or two uh, it's not that obvious always that the brand people or who owns the brands are aware of even these issues that they might have with the with the brand colors and that's really a just the basic level, like the tip of the iceberg. And when you go deeper on the on the solutions, there might be a lot and a lot more to tackle. So try to find those people who are uh, closest to the brand and start talking with them. Uh, like it was said before that try to raise the awareness. Like I used to work with uh, a lot of with um, marketing communications in my past. And the big idea with marketing communications is that you try to get the marketing communications to the corner room, you know, where the decisions are made. So that's a classic corner room situation where the doors get shut and the decisions are made there. And if you get your marketing communications work very well, you get to the corner room. So I would say, Try to get your accessibility, your organization to the corner room to get some awareness and um, decisions happen. So one of the key, ben key benefits of design systems overall is scalability. And I would say that the scalability brings uh, possibilities to scale your accessibility as well. So our, our question was at S Group, like how could we build a multi-brand design system in this ecosystem that we have? Like I told you before, we act as a middleman, but we need uh, scalability for products and different brands. And this is kind of uh, looking at things again from uh, kind of narrow point of view, but uh, since it's pretty critical again about the colors, so our approach is that, okay, so let's let's find out find out how how can we create these accessible color combinations. That there was a hefty amount of work. Uh, this is not actually done by me, but my talented colleague, uh, Mikko Vierikko, who is working in our team from group and 
the idea here is that we started to look at the color contrast, not, not just the colors, but color contrasts and how to make, make it work in a way that you found out those uh, contrast uh, values that give you the possibility to work in accessible ways. So in the middle, you can see the double AA and really, really small down there somewhere, there's a, a range of 40 to, I think it's 90. So uh, we can tackle m many of the stuff with the 50 uh, range between those um, colors. And that means the color contrast values. So going in, to the deep end with the color. So that means that we can uh, use that knowledge for those brand colors, like you see on the left. So the detailed color ramps. And of course we need more colors. So again, putting that knowledge to different types of uh, color ramps. And based, of, based on those, cause we know already how it works. So you put this, whatever it is on the other end and this, whatever color it is to the other end, you, you can get um, accessible color combinations. So pretty simply put, you have a dark color and a light color and enough range between those and those are our uh, ready-made choices. And then we also named them with the semantic, uh, grouping, uh, so it makes more sense in digital environment. And using those colors in UI components, as I told you earlier, like there's a fine fine line between uh, the dark and light colors, as, as you can see here with the ABC or ABC. We already know that with that color range, you, you would need a different type of uh, for typography uh, than the other brands. So yeah, that that kind of uh, is the main idea for us when we approach the colors in an accessible way. So we can really scale this to other brands as well. And my takeaway on that would be scalability. So uh, when you when you work with accessibility stuff start to think of from the basics, like how can I move this to a scalable uh, uh, platform as well? So you can scale your accessibility, like I said, with your design system as well. So when you put in those little pieces, it's already making a lot of stuff accessible. Uh, one thing that I would still want to mention is, uh, and I asked beforehand that will I get fired if I say this in an accessible design systems uh, event. So Nathan Cur Curtis, so this is a line from him, a quote that he says that accessible design systems doesn't guarantee accessible products. If you Google accessible design systems, this is probably one of the articles that comes up. And I really like Nathan, Nathan Curtis and uh, Antero, my, my team leader, and I have been following him probably for years and years now. Uh, he's a, he has a lot of good stuff online if you're into uh, design systems. And so in, in our design system, uh, we try to have a accessible baked in, uh, so to speak. So it should be accessible uh, by all means, uh, if it's possible. But the key thing is that the product teams who use it have still a significant role and responsibility when it comes to accessibility. So nothing is given on a silver plate, let's say, say it like that. And like Nathan Curtis says that, oh, okay, how much do I get? 
from a design system from accessibility point of view is is roughly 30 to 40 percent so the roughly 30 to 40 percent is a part that is embedded to the design system the other part is uh, created by the product teams who use it and the last bit is usually uh, found out to be or not to be uh, accessible by audits so we like uh, said before like reviewing the stuff having audits and then you need to decide what's the good enough for you so is it is it do we aim for 70 percent do we aim for 90 percent and what we think in our team is kind of uh, if you i'll try to switch these slides once again so nathan says 30 to 40 we try to say that okay we we try to get you halfway there halfway so it's uh trying to make the decisions and using it easier um how to calculate this it's it's not simple mathematics and there's no easy or right or wrong answers here um uh, so this is not like uh scientific by any means but it's uh for us it works as a guideline and what it means it we kind of try to take it as much as like a foreground as possible and then leave some of the work for the teams and then probably they would need to have the audits in our in their products and so on um and you you might ask like how, what should happen after the design system has done their work there's a lot of uh reading here but the main thing is that they you need to configure the components so we give you the components uh let's say we create a support form for screen readers in the components but you need to make sure that the context and labeling or whatever it is there and or the notifications role and such so it's it's more technical details but it's a big part of what makes them accessible and also composing uh, the uis so the user interfaces use our buttons headers whatever it is uh, you can do that wrong or right in accessibility means as well so if I give you accessible buttons, I give you accessible uh, text inputs, you can mess it up in the user, user interface. Uh, so you need to be aware on how to create those accessible solutions as well. And one thing is uh, that should be aware of as well, not, not all design systems over every part of every team needs so there are a lot of needs for uh, doing components from scratch and maybe in in good way you can contribute those to the design system later on uh, but anyways uh, don't, don't stop there so you have a responsibility to make your components like the custom components uh, accessible as well so my third takeaway would be that don't stop there so it's a continuous work like i said like uh, there could be audits more audits and so on so do them again and again to make sure that your um, service or uh, solution stays accessible and it's also multi multi-disciplinary Linary, sorry about my Finglish uh, work. Uh, so it's it's and it's not a one-off. So let's do this now, and we're always accessible and so on. Uh, it's a continuous work. And one thing is, like, like I said before, accessibility needs needs the ownership. Uh, and going through this really quick quickly because I'm running out of time. 
but the design system can only do so much. Uh, and there's a way of many ways of doing accessibility in your organization. One could be that the design system team can take over everything. And that could be fine, but they, they would need resources for that. Uh, there could be someone else doing that in the organization, but it should be someone. Someone should be the one, or there should be a group of people who owns it. And that, that makes your organization more aware and more accessible when it comes to your services, since awareness builds up the accessibility. Uh, but if it's you, so really simple stuff. Um, you need to start somewhere. So start from creating a roadmap for yourself. If, if it's only you, what can I do now? What can I do later on? Uh, one, one concrete thing is that you can start building up an accessibility checklist. So these are the things that I need to take in account when putting out some of our services. Uh, one of the next step would be defining a role role based responsibility guidelines. So who does what? Like the designers do these developers, whatever POs look over them, and you know, really basic stuff. But that can help you get into the daily ways of work, like really far on those. So start creating those tools in your organization. And those can pretty much make, make the accessibility more tangible um, and get, get to your daily ways of working. And as a reminder, like it was said before, uh, the awareness is like the step one. You need to push it uh, to get there. So start small, but start, you know, ringing the bells in your organization because getting to the meetings with different people start talking with people start talking with the leaders and uh, managers and whatnot so your organization can get bigger with accessibility so that that's my stuff thanks thank you Ville. all right so on to our big finale, um, a panel discussion with all three of our amazing speakers. So this is for sure the time to get out uh, your phones or laptops um, and then hop over to menti.com uh, and write down uh, questions you'd like to ask from the speakers. All the questions are anonymous, so, so and you can submit as much as you want. We have a bunch of questions already. Awesome. So just a, a short while and we'll we'll just set up um, our our panel discussion and we'll get to all the questions that are here. And while we're talking, you can still uh, enter any questions that come to mind. So just bear with us a few minutes and we'll set it up. Um, we'll start with a few kind of more generic questions. Let's set 
get our microphone set up. Um, but I would like to first ask, and this goes to all of you, um, what would you do if your project did not take accessibility into account or the value is not seen? So any tips on, on that? And we'll, we'll start. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Hello, hello. Um, one thing to think about is the requirements. So you you might get sued with one million dollars uh, if you don't if you don't create your services as accessible. So there's always the law and the the binding that comes with that. Uh, if you work in the field of, uh, like I showed you, the list of the services that needs to be accessible. So that's that's one thing that even the money men can understand. So, because uh, a lot of lot of the things always comes to the resources and time, like said before in the presentation. So you would need the resources and that would lead you to save money in the long run because you don't need to pay fines. I don't know. Could you say it again, please? Uh, sure. Um, so what would you do if your project did not take accessibility into account or the value of it was not seen? Any tips? I don't know. Do you just don't like customers? I don't know. I think it's quite arrogant these days to just assume everyone as abled as they are at the moment. So I don't know. That sinks to me. It's just like that kind of attitude tells me a lot that the company probably doesn't care about sustainability or about anything else. So it's the responsibility of, you know, you. why would you want to? I mean, yeah, legal requirements are always behind. But why would you? be there waiting when this finally becomes something that you have to do why don't you be the forerunner there and make things differently like with everything else be you know smart so i think that you already said everything i, I was going to say but i can answer from the pop bike bank side uh all of our services think about the accessibility because as a bank the law there is a law and we need to go with that. So, and we like our customers, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and yeah, that was my... We can continue, yes. Helen, with, with, with you. And, and there are some specific questions uh, mm -hmm. here. Um, so, Pop Bank, how is the design process working in practice? Like when you recognize a need uh, for a component, how does the need turn into a practical, usable, item uh, well uh, we edit the design system during different kind of projects so if we recognize some issues in one specific specific element we will wait for maybe, maybe we will wait for the project where we are going to fix it because we don't have that many people doing design system or go or design so we can do it all and we, we need to wait sometimes. Did that, that answer to a guest question? I hope so. <laughs> uh, there's another one. Uh, in what kind of format does the design system continue living currently? What kind of format? What that means? Mm, um, I'm guessing it's where, where does it live and ah. how do you update it? So uh, the design lives in Figma. We are using Figma. To design and our developers are using storybook yeah and what kind of benchmarks or references you used when starting the design system work uh everything <laughs> we benchmark all our uh or our competitors like banks and that kind of call uh, that kind of uh and of course, we took some kind of companies from different area, like Finnair. They have a really big design system also in the public. And 
I don't have any specific. We benchmark everything. So. Uh, and in what day did you? In what way did you take non-visual interaction into account when building your design system? Mm. Non-visual interactions. Can you explain me more? <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm guessing maybe um, that it's to do with interacting uh, using screen readers and, and ah, okay. sound effects. Yeah. And... Well, I'm not the technical person, so I don't know that much about that part. <laughs> but uh, we take the accessibility very seriously and we test a lot and our developers are testing there sound effects or voice things and that kind of stuff. Yep. And I'm guessing you actually, yeah, I think that's that's all the questions we had specifically. Um, maybe we'll continue to Ville. Uh, there's a few questions here. Yep. So how deep did the system go in accessible components? Uh, practical examples, how much info was embedded for single components? Yeah, uh, again, I'm, I'm also a designer, so I'm not going into that deeply to the technical uh, details. Uh, but let's say that how much information um it kind of depends probably like how complex is the component um some of we we like let's say that our approach is to build the most simple compo components first and then maybe grew them to be let's say the more complex components let's say we have a button and then we would maybe later on implement that to be uh, select button or what or split button or whatever it is so let's say on a practical level i i couldn't say that how many how much information was embedded to single components but i don't know i i would say that i can't give you a strict answer on that from technical point of view. Next question, please. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, so you mentioned using tools to start accessibility work. What tools should one start? Oh uh, yeah. So probably like like I told, like one one good thing is to like how you document your design and components is like the starting point. Uh, Try also, like always, try to uh, add some kind of accessibility point of view to that one design or component. So that's just, just a button. How would that be accessible? How to use it? Let's say uh, if there are two buttons, how should one interact with those? How should one design a user interface using those components so it becomes uh, accessible how to label the buttons and you know so forth so having at least that in your documentation that's like pretty much the starting point and then you can start growing that to different kinds of things so then you can start up a section on your website or whatever documentation that is like a accessibility in whole let's say and then you can also say when you're wiser that okay this is how our system works this is how we uh, need to work as an organization then you can say that okay let's let's start building this uh, let's say the accessibility checklist for example let's always check these colors let's always check these uh, labels let's always check these and these so there are always in line and intact when you publish stuff so those might be the small steps well um then there's one uh did the design covered only 
did the design system cover only accessible components or did the system have samples of accessible design patterns as well? Uh, yeah, so now we're working with only components. So the patterns will come later on, but yes, we are aiming to cover uh, bigger entities as well. So, and the, the, that's very much or very often the uh, approach start start with small and then get to bigger things so yeah uh so we're not the answer is we're not there yet cool we'll then turn to there and, and there was one i'm trying to find it uh Becoming an, an accessibility ambassador, you asked everyone to join mm -hmm. and start a revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how much time and effort might that take? Oh, well, all your life, really, I think. No, it's, well, if you don't like the idea, um, just walk away. You don't have to do anything. It's not like you have to. But uh, it just start from the small. Like I said, you need to review where you are. I don't know where you are. You might know a lot. Um, can you e increase your knowledge? Can you spread it around? Um, can you make sure your colleagues as well know about things or do you just keep everything to yourself? Um, if you don't know anything about accessibility, well, there's tons of material around there. So start learning. And like I said, you're welcome to contact us. We can give you a demo. What does it mean if you create inaccessible websites and systems? It really sucks for people. So um, you don't want to be the people who create solutions that don't work everyone don't work for everyone so how much does it take time to do, do anything i mean you're continuously learning i assume so um it's just something you want to pick up and do it's not hard i mean yeah admittedly it, reading standards are really annoying but it just once you get the gist of it you you do understand why things are there and you don't have to kind of read all those lines you you need to just understand the basic rules about it based on your role really it's about if you are deaf you need to know a bit more about things uh if you just are the person who decides what colors you should be using that's a whole different story but like i said everyone should know something about something even if it's a marketing person they need to know how to create accessible presentations for example or campaign materials, social media posts. Remember the old text, please. <laughs> so um, if it's a lifetime to, to accomplish, so how, how would you go about convincing product managers of their importance and understanding that it might take a longer time to design and implement and test um, and read through the guidelines? Um, oh, the standards are high. It's a good question. I mean, the thing is, it's all based on, uh, I think, about the values of the company. So you need to start the discussion. Where where do you stand in this line that you know you want to make make things accessible? It doesn't always necessarily mean it's more work or more costs. It depends how savvy you are, really. So, um, but I think it all comes down uh, what your values are in a company. Um, so, how does one design interaction patterns for screen readers? Um, are there any established standards for that? Uh, actually, I haven't done that much. Uh, and I'm glad to say that I, I don't really actually need to, because I have super intelligent uh, developers in my team that are really savvy on on how to create uh, the patterns for screen readers so from there are ways of um, i would say that the tech comes first in this uh, the design it's good to acknowledge so listen to your developers who are creating the solutions for screen readers and you can decide whether they want you to make some decisions before you, before they start to act on it. So let's say you could uh, start by defining ARIA labels or for example, 
to those components that could be developed uh, so in the de design phase already or stuff like that uh, but the question was is there any standards wow uh, not exactly so pro i would guess that vacag has something to say about that but i'm not that sure about it i i'm saying that yes yes there are i don't know <laughs> you, should, you should probably read the guidelines and start uh, familiar with that cool um there is actually a fun one question for you as well um so I have experience about really painful discussions with brand owners about accessibility. Any tips how to start them uh, in a constructive manner? Constructive manner. Um, not my best abilities, but um, probably like, um, well, I don't know, like some of the, like I told you, like this one brand color was not accessible. Uh, you could say that this is this is pretty common actually like there are many brands in finland as well with let's say orange brand colors uh, that might need some help with uh, discussions when it comes to accessibility not just one many orange brands out there so i'm not just saying any brand names here uh, and let's say like one one uh, approach could be that there are also tools where you can show your uh, managers or brand owners how your brands work uh, from let's say those that have disabilities with eyesight let let's say so you can you can show them examples and then ask them like do you understand what's happening with your brand in this digital environment and why should we not look into this uh like that's one approach like let's say with you you have tools for colors you have tools for uh let's say say to them that maybe you should try out navigating your service with a keyboard only or and how it works for you and maybe they might understand that okay now we're you know misleading people or or not serving everybody or you know there are tons of stuff that when you understand the like the ways of accessibility you can start maybe selling them to your managers or owners i don't know maybe do you have any comments on that well, I think also if you want to sell products worldwide, it does matter. Um, also, I mean, people see colors differently anyway. So why does it matter that you change the orange to slightly different color? Because some people don't see it anyway. So I think it's just getting that line that you can use brand colors to a certain extent, but not to have like as a text that you can't read. So it's just one of those things that you don't have to say that, oh, you can't ever use this brand color anymore. Just making those um, small changes. So, and yeah, it just, I just always wonder who are these people who uh, put just blatantly um, yellow color on a white text and they claim they can see it and read it. Who are those people? But um, I've seen some presentations and when I pointed out to the person, so you have that yellow color there, you know, can you read? Oh yeah, I have to squint in my eyes a bit. Well, okay, well, I think that's a sign it doesn't really work. But it's just like, I don't know, maybe they use really huge monitors. But yeah, once you show them on the phone, perhaps they realize I can't read anything. I think I saw a question about specifically orange or red brand color and what to do. So I think we, covered that as well quite well. Um, so I think this one you can answer both Bill and Heli. Um, did you build a design system in Figma or other software? Any tips for how to see, how you see is the best way to organize a UI kit? Uh, yeah. So the current one that I'm working on is, is built the design is built in Figma. I also work with uh, Sketch One, uh, 
and the libraries we're living in abstract so that's that's another software uh figma kind of does them both uh i would say that none of these systems or the softwares are perfect so if you think that yeah let's the figma hype is real and we should go with figma it's just a software so don't don't worry about that but of course it's a baseline for you to work on um, any tips how you see the best way of organizing the ui kit uh there's a tons of ways uh you can split everything to super small bits um our at the moment is organized by brand so we offer brands uh colors and that's by brand uh we offer them ui kits that is um so there's a ui kit for each brand that has in figma different pages that uh have so they serve as libraries that you can toggle on and off um if you don't know how to there's good tutorials on that let's say on figma.com just pretty basic ones that you can get uh moving if you are eager to learn how the setup is done in figma you just go to figma communities and start searching for the bigger uh, design systems like carbon design uh, material design uh, uh, uber has a pretty great library um, and those you can fetch to your figma and see how it's done and go into the even the nitty-gritty details of every component how, how the colors are working so yeah so best way i think there's no best way i think the best way is the what suits your organization and how small or big should it be ellie do you want to add tips from your viewpoint as well yes. so we are using figma and well the best way i don't even know what is the best way but um uh, we have components, we have modules and layouts. So three different kind of, uh, different kind of, how to say it, ways. And we have different pages for all the elements in the Figma document. So it's very simple and easy to use when you can just take the page what you want to look and edit the elements but yeah that works for us i don't know what works for you so yep thank you <clears throat> let's see maybe one or two more mm -hmm. let's see if we can get some of them scrolling So maybe how do different stakeholders react to feedback on accessibility? How to handle less than positive reactions? Hmm. You want to start? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's not an easy fight, let's say. So I would like, I would say that the big issue is always time and money. So they will say that, why should we spend five days instead of one day on this and whatever it is? Uh, so, and they say that, why should we care? And it's not in our priorities, uh, all sorts of stuff. I would say that uh, don't give up is like the, probably the main idea. So you go talk to them. They say no, you go talk to them in a week or two and tell them again the same story that you had or from a different angle. Uh, like I said, try to show them examples. Uh, even if you can find competitors that are already further in accessibility and say like, 
why are we losing this competition? They are gaining or serving more people and serving uh, better uh, in an accessibility point of view. So why shouldn't we do that as well? So you should be, you know, who doesn't want to be the best in competition? And accessibility is one. Or, or, of course, there are these regulations, and you can tell them about that. Like, should we, you know, there's the EU directives, the Finnish law, and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, how to handle, I don't know, maybe be, be uh, not get pissed off by them saying that, because it might be that it's kind of more of their loss than your loss. So you just need to be consistent and get, get back to not giving up and getting back to the uh, topic. Um, yeah, don't don't get depressed about that because it's a long long run after all. Well, I agree. Uh, I would add. Um, mm. Well, like I said, it's you need to start the discussion, and like if you start the discussion, people start to question like, oh, why why would I want to care about that? And then you explain, well, Susan can't do that because right. Uh, so they are to start to understand it does affect people that there are real people out there who can't use systems So it's like they should start to care. But yeah, it's Yeah, I mean, it's a shame that there needs to be like this legal uh, Requirement or legislation to say that system should work for everyone and I think it's a bit like um, hindrance in a way because you can always say, well, it doesn't apply to us, so why would we care? And that gives that kind of crappy attitude then um, to not to care. But you can start, you can, you know, be the change, you know. I mean, are you asking them why are you making this um, new thing in a better way? Ask, are you asking them permission to make things better and more efficient? I mean, why, why you would do that? So this is just adding to that, in my opinion. Yeah, one thing that I want to add, like uh, I had a, in my presentation a slide about um, who should do what. So if if you define that developers should handle this, uh, designers do that, uh, there's a big downside to that as well. So uh, doing that might lead to also to that fact that, OK, I don't need to do or think about this because it's on their list. but you shouldn't think about <laughs> that in that way. So uh, it's more about building awareness that you should also be aware of that. So it's not like uh, there might be a downside to this, like like you said that uh, there's there's this legislation or whatever it is. And if I read it really carefully, that it might come out as okay. I don't need to worry about this. Uh, it's it shouldn't be like that. Well, thank you. Um, so, unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time. So, um, I, I do have one last question I'd like uh, each of you uh, to ask each of you. So, what do you think is the most important thing, one key takeaway you can do in order to have accessible systems? I start to think that you need to have the will and you will find the way. Yeah, I'm on a same same line there, like probably probably like building the ownership. We were having this discussion before, like the I, I would want to have uh, an owner for every organization for accessibility, but then again, it should be everybody. So it 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 should be you, you and you, because uh, that way it's more uh, like uh, the awareness is already there on a bigger scale. Uh, but hopefully there will be someone to take on count on the accessibility, the ownership of the accessibility, and that's probably one key thing. Yeah, just to add, I mean, we did have a team 
one team who were put on charge of everything. So we had the responsibility and, um, you know, also take pride that we are doing this thing. So it's hard if you are alone. So you need to find the networks, how you can uh, work together. That's one way to go about things. Can you repeat the main question? <laughs> yes. I really like it. So, um, so what do you think is the most important thing you can do in order to have accessible systems? So what is the key kind of one takeaway you want to leave hmm. kids here and home? Huh? <laughs> Money, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's important that our customers can use our products and that gives money for us. Maybe that's the key. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we can we can do a bit of an applaud. Thank you, guys. Um, and that brings us to an end. Yes, uh, official uh, program is about, about to end. Uh, first of all, thank you on behalf of Futurize, our speakers. Uh, one more big hand to our speakers. Thank you for coming and thank you for your efforts to pre preparing the, your presentation and, and showing up here live. And, and then thank you for our online participants. Good to have you there. And thank you people who joined here today. If you are not rush in, uh, rushing at home, please stay here, mingle. We have food here. Uh, Nora has done salad with her own bare hands and we have sandwiches mingle with each other. If our speakers are not in a rush home, I don't know, but if you are not, then please stay and you can, you know, interact, ask questions and continue the, the discussion. So thank you for our behalf. If you want to check out, we have few uh, positions open at the moment. Don't be afraid that the city is Helsinki, but you, you are welcome here also. And we have this accessibility guideline. I don't know if you have been doing that. No, you're not, but you you know know this guide. You find, can find that also on our webpage. So thank you for the evening. It was a wonderful and refreshing to see people in person. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Our DJ. <laughs> we have a music on, please. So please enjoy the food. <laughs>